Good evening, and welcome to Dr. Peace Theater. My name is Dr. Dennis Business, and tonight we will continue our dive into the second of the short stories contained within the pages of the Bachman books. The Long Walk. When we last left Ray Garrity and our friends on the road, Ray had taken a mental inventory of himself. He decided that he was crazied up, but basically okay. Twenty-nine boys have bought a ticket so far, and seventy-one long walkers still remain. Tough to keep track, not everybody has a name. But that's where we'll pick it up from with Chapter 7. Scram, number 85, did not fascinate Garrity because of his flashing intelligence, because Scram wasn't all that bright. He didn't fascinate Garrity because of his moon face, his crew cut, or his build, which was moose-like. He fascinated Garrity because he was married. Really? Garrity asked for the third time. He still wasn't convinced Scram wasn't having him on. You're really... Really married? Yeah. Scram looked up at the early morning sun with real pleasure. I dropped out of school when I was 14. There was no point to it. Not for me. I wasn't no troublemaker. Just not able to make grades. And our history teacher read us an article about how schools are overpopulated. So I figured why not let somebody in who can learn. I'll get down to business. I wanted to marry Kathy anyway. How old are you? Garrity asked, more fascinated than ever. They were passing through another small town, and the sidewalks were lined with signs and spectators. But he hardly noticed. Already the watchers were in another world, not related to him in any way. They might have been behind a thick plate glass shield. Fifteen, Scram answered. He scratched his chin, which was blue with beard stubble. Nobody tried to talk you out of it? There was a guidance counselor at school. He gave me a lot of shit about sticking with it and not being a ditch digger. But he had more important things to do besides keep me in school. I guess you could say he gave me the soft sell. Besides, somebody has to dig ditches, right? He waved enthusiastically at a group of little girls who were going through a spastic cheerleader routine. Pleated skirts and scabbed knees flying. Anyhow, I never did dig no ditch. Never dug one in my whole career. Went to work for a bedsheet factory out in Phoenix. Three dollars an hour. Me and Kathy were happy people, Scram smiled. Sometimes we'll be watching TV, and Kath will grab me and say, We're happy people, honey. She's peach. Do you have any kids? Garrity asked, feeling more and more like this was an insane discussion. Well, Kathy's pregnant right now. She said we should wait until we had enough in the bank to pay for the delivery. When we got up to 700, she said go, and we went. She caught pregnant in no time at all. Scram looked sternly at Garrity. My kid's going to college. They say dumb guys like me never have smart kids. But Kathy's smart enough for both of us. Kathy finished high school. I made her finish. Four night courses, and then she took the HSET. My kid is going to do as much college as he wants. Garrity didn't say anything. He couldn't think of anything to say. McVries was off to the side in close conversation with Olson. Baker and Abraham were playing a word game called Ghost. He wondered where Harkness was. It was far out of sight, anyway. And that was Scram, too. Really out of sight. Hey, Scram, I think you made a bad mistake. Your wife? She's pregnant, Scram. But that doesn't win you any special favors around here. 700 in the bank? You don't spell pregnant with just three numbers, Scram. And no insurance company in the world would touch a long walker. Garrity stared at and threw a man in a houndstooth jacket. 
who was deliriously waving a straw hat with a stringy brim. Scram, what happens if you buy it? He asked cautiously. Scram smiled gently. Not me. I feel like I could walk forever. Say, I wanted to be in the long walk ever since I was old enough to want anything. I walked 80 miles just two weeks ago. No sweat. But suppose something should happen. But Scram only chuckled. How old's Kathy? She's about a year older than me. She's almost 18. Her folks are with her now there, down in Phoenix. It sounded to Garrity as if Kathy Scram's folks knew something Scram himself did not. You must love her a lot, he said, a little wistfully. Scram smiled, showing the stubborn last survivors of his teeth. I ain't looked at anyone else since I married her. Kathy's a peach. And you're doing this. And Scram laughed. Ain't it fun? Not for Harkness, Garrity said sourly. Go ask him if he thinks it's fun. You don't have any grasp of the consequences, Pearson said, falling in between Garrity and Scram. You could lose. You have to admit you could lose. Vegas odds made me the favorite just before the walk started, Scram said. I'm odds on favorite. Sure, Pearson said glumly. And you're in shape, too. Anyone can see that. Pearson himself looked pale and peaked after the long night on the road. He glanced disinterestedly at the crowd gathered in a supermarket parking lot they were just passing. Everyone who wasn't in shape is dead now, or almost dead, but there's still 72 of us left. Yeah, but... A thinking frown spread over the broad circle of Scram's face. Garrity could almost hear the machinery up there working, slow and ponderous, but in the end, as sure as death and as inescapable as taxes. It was somehow awesome. I don't want to make you guys mad, Scram said. You're good guys. But you didn't get into this thinking of winning out and getting the prize. Most of these guys don't know why they got into it. Look at that Barkovich. He ain't in it to get no prize. He's just walking to see other people die. He lives on it. When someone gets a ticket, he gets a little more gold power. It ain't enough. He'll dry up like a leaf on a tree. And me? Garrity asked. Scram looked troubled. Oh, hell. No, go on. Well, the way I see it, you don't know why you're walking either. It's the same thing. You're going now because you're afraid. But that, that's not enough. That wears out. Scram looked down at the road and rubbed his hands together. And when it wears out, I guess you'll buy a ticket like the rest, Ray. Garrity thought about McVries saying, When I get tired, really tired, why, I guess I will just sit down. You'll have to walk a long time to walk me down, Garrity said. But Scram's simple assessment of the situation had scared him badly. I, Scram said, am ready to walk a long, long time. Their feet rose and fell on the asphalt, carrying them forward, around a curve, down a dip, and then over a railroad track that was metal grooves in the road. They passed a closed fried clam shack. Then they were out in the country again. I understand what it is to die, I think, Pearson said abruptly. Now I do anyway. Not death itself. I still can't comprehend that. But dying. If I stop walking, I will come to an end. He swallowed and there was a click in his throat. Just like a record after the last groove. He looked at Scram earnestly. Maybe it's like you say. Maybe it's not enough, but I don't want to die. Scram looked at him almost scornfully. You think just knowing about death will keep you from dying? 
Pearson smiled a funny, sick little smile. Like a businessman on a heaving boat trying to keep his dinner down. Right now, that's all that's keeping me going. And Garrity felt a huge gratefulness because his defenses had not been reduced to that. At least, not yet. Up ahead, quite suddenly, and as if to illustrate the subject they had been discussing, a boy in a black turtleneck sweater suddenly had a convulsion. He fell on the road and began to snap and sunfish and jackknife viciously. His limbs jerked and flopped. There was a funny gargling noise in his throat, a sheep-like sound that was entirely mindless. As Garrity hurried past, one of the fluttering hands bounced against his shoe, and he felt a wave of frantic revulsion. The boy's eyes were rolled up to the whites. There were splotches of foam splattered on his lips and chin. He was being second warned, but of course he was beyond hearing. And when his two minutes were up, they shot him like a dog. Not long after that, they reached the top of a gentle grade and stared down into the green, unpopulated country ahead. Garrity was grateful for the cool morning breeze that slipped over his fast perspiring body. That is some view, Scram said. The road could be seen for perhaps 12 miles ahead. It slid down the long slope, ran in flat zigzags through the woods, a blackish-gray charcoal mark across a green swatch of crepe paper. Far ahead it began to climb again, and faded into the rosy pink haze of early morning light. This might be what they call the Haynesville Woods, Garrity said. Not too sure. Trucker's Graveyard. Hell in the wintertime. I never seen nothing like it. Scram said reverently. There isn't this much green in the whole state of Arizona. Enjoy what you can, Baker said, joining the group. It's going to be a scorcher. It's hot already, and it's only 6.30 in the morning. You think you'd get used to it where you come from, Pearson said, almost resentfully. You don't get used to it, Baker said, slinging his jacket over his arm. You just learn to live with it. It's like to build a house up here. Scram said. He sneezed heartily, twice, sounding like a bull in heat. Build it right up here with my two old hands, and look at the view every morning, me and Kathy. Maybe I will someday, when this is all over. Nobody said anything. By 6.45, the ridge was above and behind them. The breeze mostly cut off, and the heat already walked among them. Garrity took off his own jacket, rolled it, and tied it securely about his waist. The road through the woods was no longer deserted. Here and there, early risers had parked their cars on the road or stood or sat in clumps, cheering, waving, and holding signs. Two girls stood behind a battered sports car at the bottom of one dip. They were wearing tight summer shorts, midi blouses, and sandals. There were cheers and whistles. The faces of these girls were hot, flushed, and excited by something ancient, sinuous, and, to Garrity, erotic almost to the point of insanity. He felt animal lust rising in him, an aggressively alive thing that made his body shake with a fever all its own. It was Gribble, the radical among them, that suddenly dashed at the girls, his feet kicking up spurts of dust along the shoulder. One of them leaned back against the hood of the sports car and spread her legs slightly, tilting her hips up at him. Gribble put his hands over her breasts. She made no effort to stop him. He was warned, hesitated, and then plunged against her. A jamming, hurtling, frustrated, angry, frightened figure in a sweaty white shirt and cord pants. The girl hooked her ankles around Gribble's calves and put her arms lightly around his neck. They kissed. Gribble took a second warning, then a third, and then... With perhaps 15 seconds of grace left, he stumbled away and broke into a frantic, shambling run. He fell down, picked himself up, clutched at his crotch, and staggered back onto the road. His tin face was hectically flushed. Couldn't, he was sobbing. Wasn't enough time, and she wanted me to, and I couldn't. I, he was weeping and staggering, his hands pressed against his crotch. His words were little more than indistinct wails. So you gave them their little thrill, 
Barkovich said. Something for them to talk about and show and tell tomorrow. Just shut up! Gribble screamed. He dug at his crotch. It hurts. I got a cramp. Blue balls, Pearson said. That's what he's got. Gribble looked at him through the stringy bangs of black hair that had fallen over his eyes. He looked like a stunned weasel. It hurts, he muttered again. He dropped slowly to his knees, hands pressed in his lower belly, head drooping, back bowed. He was shivering and snuffling and Garrity could see the beads of sweat on his neck. Some of them caught in the fine hairs on the nape. What Garrity's own father had always called quack fuzz. A moment later, he was dead. Garrity turned his head to look at the girls, but they had retreated inside their sports car. They were nothing but shadow shapes. He made a determined effort to push them from his mind, but they kept creeping back in. How must it have been? Dry humping that warm, willing flesh. Her thighs had twitched. My God, they had twitched. In a kind of spasm orgasm oh god the uncontrollable urge to squeeze and caress and most of all to feel that heat that heat he felt himself go that warm shooting flow of sensation warming him wetting him oh christ it would soak through his pants and someone would notice notice and point a finger and ask him how he'd like to walk around the neighborhood with no clothes on walk naked walk and walk and walk oh Jan I really love you he thought but it was confused all mixed up in something else he retied his jacket about his waist and then went on walking as before and the memory dulled and browned very quickly like a Polaroid negative left out in the sun the pace stepped up they were on a steep downhill grade now and it was hard to walk slowly Muscles worked hard and pistoned and squeezed against each other. The sweat rolled freely. Incredibly, Garrity found himself wishing for night again. He looked over at Olsen curiously, wondering how he was making it. Olsen was staring at his feet again. The cords in his neck were knotted and rigid. His lips were drawn back in a frozen grin. He's almost there now, McVrie said at his elbow, startling him. When they start half hoping that someone will shoot them so they can rest their feet, they're not far away. Is that right? Garrity asked crossly. How come everybody around here knows so much more about it than me? Because you're so sweet, McVrie said tenderly. And then he sped up letting his legs catch the downgrade, and passed Garrity by. Stebbins. He hadn't thought about Stebbins in a long time. He turned his head to look for Stebbins. Stebbins was there. The pack had strung out, coming down the long hill, and Stebbins was about a quarter of a mile back. But there was no mistake in those purple pants and that chambray work shirt. Stebbins was still tailing the pack like some thin vulture just waiting for them to fall. Garrity felt a wave of rage. He had a sudden urge to rush back and throttle Stebbins. There was no rhyme or reason to it, but he had to actively fight the compulsion down. By the time they had reached the bottom of the grade, Garrity's legs felt rubbery and unsteady. The state of numb wariness his flesh had more or less settled into was broken by unexpected darning needles of pain that drove through his feet and legs threatening to make his muscles knot and cramp. And Jesus, he thought, why not? They had been on the road for 22 hours, 22 hours of non-stop walking. It was unbelievable. How do you feel now? He asked Scram, as if the last time he asked had been 12 hours ago. Fit and fine, Scram said. He wiped the back of his hand across his nose, sniffed and spat just as fine as fine can be. You sound like you're getting a cold. No, it's the pollen. Happens every spring. Hay fever. I can even get it in Arizona, but I never catch colds. 
Garrity opened his mouth to reply when a hollow poom poom sound echoed back from far ahead. It was rifle fire. The word came back. Harkness had burnt out. There was an odd, elevatorish sensation in Garrity's stomach as he passed the word on back. The magic circle was unbroken. Harkness would never write his book about the long walk. Harkness was being dragged off the road someplace up ahead, like a grain bag, or was being tossed into a truck wrapped securely in a canvas body bag. For Harkness, the long walk was over. Harkness, McVries said. Old Harkness bought a ticket to see the farm. Why don't you write him a poem? Barkovich called over. Shut up, killer! McVries answered absently. He shook his head. Old Harkness. Son of a bitch. I ain't no killer, Barkovich screamed. I'll dance on your grave, Scarface. I'll... A chorus of angry shouts silenced him. Muttering, Barkovich glared at McVries, then began to stalk on a little faster, not looking around. You know what my uncle did? Baker said suddenly. They were passing through a shady tunnel of overleafing trees, and Garrity was trying to forget about Harkness and Gribble and only think of the coolness. What? Abraham asked. He was an undertaker, Baker said. <laughs> Good deal, Abraham said disinterestedly. When I was a kid, I always used to wonder, Baker said vaguely. He seemed to lose track of his thought, and then glanced at Garrity and smiled. It was a peculiar smile. Who would embalm him? I mean, like, you wonder who cuts the barber's hair or who operates on the doctor for gallstones, you see? It takes a lot of gall to be a doctor, McVries said solemnly. You know what I mean. So who got the call when the time came? Abraham asked. Yeah, Scram added. Who did it? Baker looked up at the twinning heavy branches under which they were passing, and Garrity noticed that Baker now looked exhausted. Not that we all don't look that way, he added to himself. Come on, McVries said. Don't keep us hanging. Who buried him? This is the oldest joke in the world, Abraham said. Baker says, whatever made you think he was dead? He is, though, Baker said, lung cancer, six years ago. Did he smoke? Abraham asked, waving at a family of four and their cat. The cat was on a leash. It was a Persian cat. It looked mean and pissed off. Nope. Not even a pipe, Baker said he was afraid it would give him cancer. Oh, for Christ's sake, McVries said. Who buried him? Tell us so we can discuss world problems or baseball or birth control or something. I think birth control is a world problem, Garrett, he said seriously. My girlfriend is Catholic and come on, McVries bellowed. Who the fuck buried your grandfather, Baker? My uncle. He was my uncle. My grandfather was a lawyer in Shreveport. He... I don't give a shit, McVries said. I don't give a shit. It's the old gentleman that had three cocks. I just want to know who buried him so we can get over it. Actually, nobody buried him. He wanted to be cremated. Oh, my aching balls, Abraham said, and then laughed a little. My aunt has got his ashes in a ceramic vase. At her house in Baton Rouge. She tries to keep the business going, the undertaking business. But nobody much seemed to cotton to a lady undertaker. I doubt if that was it, McVries said. No? I think your uncle jinxed her. Jinx? How do you mean? Baker was interested. Well, you have to admit, it wasn't a very good advertisement for the business. What, dying? No, McVries said, getting cremated. Scram chuckled stuffily through his plugged nose. He's got you there, old buddy. I expect he might. Baker said, and he and McVries beamed at each other. Your uncle, Abraham said heavily, bores the tits off me. And I might also add that he, at that moment, Olsen began begging one of the guards to let him rest. Fuck. He did not stop walking or slow down enough to be warned, but his voice rose and fell in a begging, pleading, totally craven monotone that made Garrity crawl with embarrassment for him. Conversation lagged. Spectators watched Olsen with horrified fascination. 
Garrity wished Olsen would shut up before he gave the rest of them a black eye. He didn't want to die either, but if he had to, he wanted to go out without people thinking he was a coward. The soldier stared over Olsen, through him, around him, wooden-faced, deaf, and dumb. They gave an occasional warning, though, so Garrity supposed you couldn't call them dumb. It got to be quarter to eight, and the word came back they were just six miles short of a hundred miles. Garrity could remember that reading the largest number to ever complete the first hundred miles of a long walk was 63. They looked a sure bet to crack that record. There were still 69 in this group. Not that it mattered one way or the other. Olson's pleas rose in a constant garbled litany to Garrity's left, somehow seeming to make the day hotter and more uncomfortable than it was. Several of the boys shouted at Olson, but he seemed either not to hear or not to care. They passed through a wooden covered bridge the planks rumbling and bumping under their feet. Garrity could hear the secretive flap and swoop of the barn swallows that had made their homes among the rafters. It was refreshingly cool, and the sun seemed to drill down even hotter when they reached the other side. Wait till later if you think it's hot now, he told himself. Wait until you get back into open country. Boy, howdy. He yelled for a canteen, and a soldier trotted over with one. He handed it to Garrity wordlessly and then trotted back. Garrity's stomach was also growling for food. At nine o'clock, he thought, I have to keep walking till then. Be damned if I'm going to die on an empty stomach. Baker cut past him suddenly, looked around for spectators, saw none, dropped his britches and squatted. He was warned. Garrity passed him but heard the soldier warn him again. About twenty seconds after that, he caught up with Garrity and McVreeze again, badly out of breath. He was clinching his pants. Fastest crap I ever took, he said, badly out of breath. You should have brought a catalog along, McVreeze said. I never could go very long without a crap, Baker said. Some guys, hell, they'll crap once a week. I'm a once a day man. If I don't crap once a day, I take a laxative. Those laxatives will ruin your intestines, Pearson said. Oh, shit. Baker scoffed. McVreeze threw back his head and laughed. Abraham twisted his head around to join the conversation. My grandfather never used a laxative in his life, and he lived to be... You kept records, I presume, Pearson said. You wouldn't be doubting my grandfather's words, would you? Heaven forbid, Pearson rolled his eyes. Okay, my grandfather, look, Garrity said softly, not interested in either side of the laxative argument. He had been idly watching Percy What's-His-Name. Now he was watching him closely, hardly believing what his eyes were seeing. Percy had been edging closer and closer to the side of the road. Now he was walking on the sandy shoulder. Every now and then he snapped a tight, frightened glance at the soldiers on top of the half-track, then to his right at the thick screen of trees less than seven feet away. I think he's going to break for it, Garrity said. They'll shoot him sure as hell, Baker said. His voice had dropped to a whisper. It doesn't look like anyone's watching him, Pearson replied. Then for God's sake, don't tip them, McVrie said angrily. You bunch of dummies, Christ! For the next ten minutes, none of them said anything sensible. They aped conversation and watched Percy, watching the soldiers, watching and mentally gauging the short distance to the thick woods. He hasn't got the guts. Pearson muttered finally, and before any of them could answer, Percy began walking, slowly and unhurriedly towards the woods. Two steps, then three, one more, two at the most, and he would be there. His jeans-clad legs moved unhurriedly. He hasn't got the guts, in three. He hasn't got the guts, McVries muttered finally, and before any of them could answer, Percy began walking, slowly and unhurriedly, towards the woods. Two steps, then three. One more, two at the most, and he would be there. His jeans-clad legs moved unhurriedly. His sun-bleached blonde hair ruffled just a little in a light puff of breeze. He might have been an explorer scout out for a day of bird watching. There were no warnings. Percy had forfeited his right to them when his right foot passed over the verge of the shoulder. 
Percy had left the road, and the soldiers had known all along. Old Percy What's-His-Name hadn't been fooling anybody. There was one sharp, clean report, and then Garrity jerked his eyes from Percy to the soldier standing on the back deck of the half-track. The soldier was a sculpture in clean, angular lines. The rifle nested into the hollow of his shoulder, his head half-cocked along the barrel. Then, his head swiveled back to Percy again. Percy was the real show, wasn't he? Percy was standing with both his feet on the weedy border of the pine forest now. He was as frozen and as sculpted as the man who had shot him. The two of them together would have been a subject for Michelangelo, Garrity thought. Percy stood utterly still under a blue springtime sky. One hand was pressed to his chest like a poet about to speak. His eyes were wide and somehow ecstatic. A bright seepage of blood ran through his fingers, shining in the sunlight. Old Percy, what's your name? Hey, Percy, your mother's calling. Hey, Percy, does their mother know you're out? Hey, Percy, what kind of a silly sissy name is that, Percy? Percy, aren't you cute? Percy transformed into a bright, sunlit Adonis, counterpointed by the one savage, dun-colored huntsman. And one, two, three coin-shaped splatters of blood fell on Percy's travel-dusty black shoes, and all of it happened in the space of only three seconds. Garrity did not even take two full steps, and he was not warned. And oh, Percy, what is your mother going to say? Do you? Tell me, do you really have the nerve to die? Percy did. He pitched forward, struck a small, crooked sapling, rolled through a half-turn, and landed face up to the sky. The grace the frozen symmetry. They were gone now. Percy was just dead. Let this ground be seeded with salt, McVree said suddenly and very rapidly, so that no stock of corn or wheat shall ever grow. Cursed be the children of this ground, and cursed be their loins. Also cursed be their hams and hawks. Hail Mary, full of grace, let us blow this goddamn place. McVries began to laugh. Shut up, Abraham said hoarsely. Stop talking like that. All the world is God, McVries said and giggled hysterically. We're walking on the Lord. And back there, the flies are crawling on the Lord. In fact, the flies are also the Lord. So blessed be the fruit of thy womb, Percy. Amen, hallelujah, chunky peanut butter. Our Father, which art in tinfoil, hallowed be thy name. I'll hit you, Abraham warned. His face was very pale. I will, Pete. A praying man, McVries said. And he giggled again. Oh, my suds and body. Oh, my sainted hat. I'll hit you if you don't shut up, Abraham bellowed. Don't, Garrity said frightened. Please don't fight. Let's, let's just be nice. You want a party favor? Baker asked crazily. Who asked you, you goddamn redneck? He was awfully young to be on this hike, Baker said sadly. If he was 14, I'll smile and kiss a pig. Mother spoiled him, Abraham said in a trembling voice. You could tell. He looked around at Garrity and Pearson pleadingly. You could tell, couldn't you? She won't spoil him any more, McVries said. Olson suddenly began babbling at the soldiers again. The one who had shot Percy and was now sitting down and eating a sandwich. They walked past 8 o'clock. They passed a sunny gas station where a mechanic in greasy coveralls was hosing off the tarmac. I wish he'd spray us with some of that, Scram said. I'm hot as a poker. We're all hot, Garrity said. I thought it never got hot in Maine, Pearson said. He sounded more tired than ever. Thought Maine was supposed to be cool. Well, then now you know different, Garrity said shortly. You're a lot of fun, Garrity, Pearson said. You know that? You're really a lot of fun. Gee, I'm glad I met you, McVries laughed. You know what? Garrity replied. What? You got skid marks in your underwear, Garrity said. It was the wittiest thing he could think of at short notice. Hmm. They had passed another truck stop. Two or three big rigs were pulled in, hauled off the highway, no doubt, to make room for the long walkers. One of the drivers was standing anxiously by his rig, a huge refrigerator truck, and feeling the side, feeling the cold that was slipping away in the morning sun. 
Several of the waitresses cheered as the walkers trudged by, and the trucker, who had been feeling the side of his refrigerator compartment, turned and gave them the finger. He was a huge man, with a red neck bulling its way out of a dusty t-shirt. Now why do you want to do that? Scram cried. Just a rotten old sport. McVreeze laughed. That's the first honest citizen we've come across since this clam bake got started, Scram. Man, do I love him. Probably he's loaded up with perishables headed for Montreal, Garrity said, all the way from Boston. We forced him off the road. He's probably afraid he'll lose his job or his rig if he's an independent. Isn't that tough? Collie Parker brayed. Isn't that too goddamn tough? They've only been telling people what the route was going to be for two months or more. Just another goddamn hick. That's all. You seem to know a lot about it, Abraham said to Garrity. A little, Garrity said, staring at Parker. My father drove a, a big rig before he got, before he went away. It's a hard job to make a buck in. Probably that guy back there thought he had time to make it to his next cutoff. He wouldn't have come this way if there was a shorter route. He didn't have to give us the finger. Scram insisted. He didn't have to do that. By God, his rotten old tomatoes aren't life and death like this is. Your father took off on your mother? McVreeze asked Garrity. My dad was squatted, Garrity said shortly. Silently, he dared Parker or anyone else to open his mouth. But no one said anything. Stebbins was still walking last. He had no more than passed the truck stop before the burly driver was swinging back up into the cab of his jimmy. Up ahead, the guns cracked out their single word. A body spun, flipped over, and laid still. Two soldiers dragged it over to the side of the road. A third tossed them in a body bag from the half-track. I had an uncle that was squatted, Wyman said hesitantly. Garrity noticed that the tongue of Wyman's left shoe had worked out from beneath the lacings and was flapping obscenely. No one but goddamn fools get squatted, Collie Parker said clearly. Garrity looked at him and wanted to feel angry, but he dropped his head and stared at the road. His father had been a goddamn fool, all right. A goddamn drunkard who could not keep two cents together in the same place for long, no matter what he tried his hand at. A man without the sense to keep his political opinions to himself. Garrity felt old and sick. Shut your stinking trap, McVries said coldly. You want to try and make me? No, I don't want to try to make you. Just shut up, you son of a bitch. Collie Parker dropped back between Garrity and McVries. Pearson and Abraham moved away a little. Even the soldiers straightened, ready for trouble. Parker studied Garrity for a long moment. His face was broad and beaded with sweat, his eyes still arrogant. Then he clapped Garrity briefly on the arm. I got a loose lip sometimes. I didn't mean anything by it, okay? Garrity nodded wearily, and Parker shifted his glance to McVreeze. Piss on you, Jack, he said, and moved up again towards the vanguard. What an unreal bastard, McVreeze said glumly. No worse than Barkovich, Abraham said, maybe even a little better. Besides, Pearson added, what's getting squatted? I mean, it beats the hell out of getting dead, am I right? How would you know? Garrity asked, how would any of us know? His father had been a sandy-haired giant, with a booming voice and a bellowing laugh that had sounded to Garrity's small ears like mountains cracking open. After he lost his own rig, he made a living driving government trucks out of Brunswick. It would have been a good living if Jim Garrity could have kept his politics to himself. But when you work for the government, the government is twice as aware that you're alive. Twice as ready to call in a squad if things seem a little dicky around the edges. And Jim Garrity had not been much of a long walk booster. So one day, he got a telegram, and the next day, two soldiers turned up on the doorstep, and Jim Garrity had gone with them, blustering. His wife had closed the door and her cheeks had been pale as milk, and when Garrity asked his mother where Daddy was going with the soldier men's, she slapped him hard enough to make his mouth bleed and told him to shut up, shut up. Garrity had never seen his father since. It had been eleven years. It had been a neat removal. Odorless, sanitized, pasteurized, sanfurized, and dandruff-free. 
I had a brother that was in a lot of law trouble, Baker said. Not the government, just the law. He stole himself a car and drove all the way from our town to Hadesburg, Mississippi. He got two years suspended sentence, but he's dead now. Dead? The voice was a dried husk, wraith-like. Olson had joined them. His haggard face seemed to stick out a mile from his body. He had a heart attack, Baker said. He was only three years older than me. Ma used to say he was her cross, but he only got into bad trouble that one time. I did worse. I was a night rider for three years. Garrity looked over at him. There was shame in Baker's tired face, but there was also dignity there outlined against a dusky shaft of sunlight poking through the trees. That's a squatting offense, but I didn't care. I was only 12 when I got into it. Ain't hardly nothing but kids who go night riding now, you know. Older heads are wiser heads. They tell us to go do it and pat our heads. But they weren't out to get squatted. Not them. I got out after we burnt a cross on some black man's lawn. I was scared green and ashamed too. Why does somebody want to go burning a cross on some black man's lawn? Jesus Christ, that stuff's history, isn't it? Sure it is. Baker shook his head vaguely. It wasn't right. At that moment, the rifles went again. There goes one more, Scram said. His voice sounded clogged and nasal, and he wiped his nose with the back of his hand. Thirty-four, Pearson said. He took a penny out of one pocket and put it in the other. I brought along 99 pennies. Every time someone buys a ticket, I put one of them in the other pocket. And when, that's gruesome, Olson said. His haunted eyes stared balefully at Pearson. Where's your death watch? Where's your voodoo dolls? Pearson didn't say anything. He studied the fallow field where they were passing with anxious embarrassment. Finally, he muttered, I didn't mean to say anything about it. It was for good luck, that's all. It's dirty, Olson croaked. It's filthy. It's, oh, quit it, Abraham said. Just quit getting on my nerves. <sighs> Garrity looked at his watch. It was 20 past eight, 40 minutes to food. He thought how nice it would be to go into one of those little roadside diners that dotted the road, snuggle his fanny against one of the padded counter stools, put his feet up on the rail. Oh, God, just the relief of that and order steak and fried onions with a side of french fries and a big dish of vanilla ice cream with strawberry sauce for dessert. Or maybe a big plate of spaghetti and meatballs with Italian bread and peas swimming in butter on the side and milk, a whole pitcher of milk, to hell with the tubes and the canteens of distilled water, milk and solid food and a place to sit and eat in. Wouldn't that be fine? Just ahead, a family of five, mother, father, boy, girl, and white-haired grandmother, were spread beneath a large elm, eating a picnic breakfast of sandwiches and what looked like hot cocoa. They waved cheerily at the walkers. Freaks, Garrity muttered. What was that? McVries asked. I said I want to sit down and have something to eat. Look at those people, fucking bunch of pigs. You'd be doing the same thing, McVries said. He waved and smiled saving the biggest, flashiest part of his smile for the grandmother, who was waving back and chewing. Well, gumming was closer to the truth. What looked like an egg salad sandwich. The hell I would! Sit there and eat while a bunch of starving... Hardly starving, Ray. It just feels that way. Hungry, then! Mind over matter, McVries incanted. Mind over matter, my young friend. The incantation had become a steamy imitation of W.C. Fields. To hell with you. You just don't want to admit it. Those people, they're animals. They want to see someone's brains on the road. That's why they turn out. they just as soon see yours. That isn't the point, McVries said calmly. Didn't you say you went to go see the long walk when you were younger? Yeah, that's when I didn't know any better. Well, it makes it okay, doesn't it? McVries uttered a short, ugly-sounding laugh. Sure, they're animals. You think you found out a new principle? Sometimes I wonder just how naive you really are. The French lords and ladies used to screw after the guillotinings. The old Romans used to stuff each other during the gladiatorial matches. That's entertainment, Garrity. 
It's nothing new. He laughed again. Garrity stared at him, fascinated. Go on, someone said. You're at second base, McFreeze. Why not try for third? Go on, I'm going to do that again. Three. Go on, someone said. You're at second base, McFreeze. Why not try for third? Garrity didn't have to turn. It was Stebbins, of course. Stebbins, the lean Buddha. His feet carried him along automatically, but he was dimly aware that they felt swollen and slippery, as if they were filling with pus. Death is great for the appetites, McVreeze said. How about those two girls in Gribble? They wanted to see what screwing a dead man felt like. Now for something completely new and different. I don't know if Gribble got much out of it, but they sure as shit did. It's the same with anybody. It doesn't matter if they're eating or drinking or sitting on their cans. They like it better. They feel it and taste it better because they're watching dead men. But that's not even really the point of this little expedition, Garrity. The point is, they are the smart ones. They're not getting thrown to the lions. They're not staggering along and hoping they won't have to take a shit with two warnings against them. You're dumb, Garrity. You and me and Pearson and Barkovich and Stebbins, we're all dumb. Scram is dumb because he thinks he understands and he doesn't. Olsen's dumb because he understands too much, too late. They're animals, all right. But why are you so goddamn sure that makes us human beings? He paused, badly out of breath. There, he said. You went and got me going. Sermonette number 342 in a series of 6,000, etc., etc. That probably cut my lifespan by five hours or more. Then why are you doing it? Garrity asked him. If you know so much, and if you're that sure... Why are you doing it? The same reason we're all doing it, Stebbins said. He smiled gently, almost lovingly. His lips were a little sun-parched. Otherwise, his face was still unlined and seemingly invincible. We want to die. That's why we're doing it. Why else, Garrity? Why else? That was chapter 7 of The Long Walk, the second short story contained within the pages of the Bachman books. That was a difficult chapter. A lot of boys bought a ticket, and Harkness ran over to the girls on the sports car hood, grabbed her boobs, and made it back without getting shot. That's a long walk wizard right there. I didn't think you could do that, because he ran over to the girls, right? did that got warnings and then ran back but percy was on the other side of the road and he was just inching towards the side and then right when he put his foot over he got shot so it seems like both those dudes did the same thing but had different rules if you can't step off the road then why did harkness get warned on the way to the sports car when percy was on the left side of the road and just was inching over inching over and then was inching to the trees and as soon as he left the road that means your warnings are no longer valid and you're shot on sight so i don't know how that happened but we can discuss it next time because this has been dr peace theater and my name is dr dennis business and as always my friends <laughs>